So, good afternoon, everybody. We are going to start uh, the first session of the President's Lecture uh, this year. So, uh, this is an initiative of SIM for the Center, International Center for Mathematics and from SPM, which is the Portuguese Mathematics Society. And uh, this is taking place every year since 2009. Uh, last three years it was done online, first because of the pandemics, of course, and then because we learned that it is possible to do things online. <laughs> and then last year uh, the speaker preferred to, to, to deliver online. But, so this is the first time since 2019 that is returning to the, to the in-person uh, presentation. Uh, which uh, I think is quite nice, it was a long time without, without in-person presentation. Um, so this, when it is in person, uh, usually there is at least two talks uh, in the country, so we try, SIM tries to, to separate between universities so that everybody can have a chance to, to travel to, to, some, to some place and uh, attend some lecture. The two lectures are, the lectures are, are usually different from one another, this is, this is the, same, the same in this year. So this is the first lecture here. There will be another one on Friday in Lisbon. And um, uh, so I'd like to, to thank the University of Aveiro for uh, accepting to, 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 to host the, the, the lecture here. Uh, as far as I remember, this is maybe the second time that this happens in Aveiro. And uh, so I, I thank the university. Of course, I will thank also the mathematics department. Uh, in the person of the two directors, because there was Manuel Juan Martins was, was finishing the, the direction, then the Alshan Armaida started the direction. The, we have support for, for both directors. Mm -hmm. Also, the support of SIDMA, our Mathematical Research Center, uh, whose who's credit is, is the Open Tours. Okay. And so, the, so, I think for the logistics and also for some complementary financial support. Um, and uh, I also would like to thank the two, 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 two people in special, uh, Lais Freitas and Isabel Pereira, because they, they were uh, organizing locally the, 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 this, this, this event. And, uh, and of course, I'd like to thank the, the speaker, because we have accepted to come, Professor Richard Davis. And uh, not only he accepted the prompt leaves, but he also um, contributed somewhat to the financial effort of, of SIM and the, and, and, and the SPM. And uh, now I will give the floor to, to Professor Miguel Carvalho, who is going to introduce the, the speaker. Uh, Professor Miguel Carvalho uh, he is at present uh, president of the Statistical, Statistical Portuguese Society, yes. Um, and uh, he's finishing the, his, uh, his mandate. And, uh, he also has been involved in interviewing with Professor Richard Davis. The interview is going to, to come out in the symbol team, the ne ne next issue. So I think maybe, apart from the speaker himself, maybe it's the best person to, the person who knows better the, the speaker <laughs> in his work. So I think it is, it is very convenient that, that you accept it. Yeah, thank you very much to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor that we have a world authority such as Richard Davis here with, with us uh, today. So uh, I, would like, I would like to introduce the, the speaker. Uh, Richard is world authority in a variety of, of topics, including time series modeling, applied probability, as well as extreme value theory. And including other topics as well, such as, for example, spatial temporal modeling. He has done a variety of, of contributions uh, to, to the field of mathematical statistics in, in general. And this is a Pedro lecture. And as, as you're all aware of, Pedro is well known among his students also for his contributions in terms of mathematical modeling of navigation, I'll call it, mathematical modeling of navigation over space and geography. Today's lecture moves from space to time because our speaker today will be presenting one of his many contributions in the time series and domain, and a domain where he has been making lots of 
uh, noteworthy and influential contributions. He was president of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, editor-in-chief of the celebrated Burnley Journal, and is co-author of many well-known and best-selling books in the field of, of time series, which again will be related with, with the topic of, of today's talk. Richard is the Howard Levine Professor of Statistics at Columbia University. He received his PhD in Mathematics from University of California, San Diego, and has held positions at MIT, Colorado State, and visiting appointments at a variety of other prestigious institutions as, as well. He's an elected fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, elected member of the International Statistical Institute, as well as a fellow of the American Statistical Association. Uh, among his many awards, I'd like to, to mention also uh, an award that was jointly gathered with his collaborator, Bruce Moore, uh, the prestigious Cookman Prize uh, for Econometric uh, Theory. He has advised a variety of noteworthy students who are currently also influential in the field today, and and his many contributions, including the ones I mentioned before, I would also would like to mention his work in terms of heavy tilt modeling and the lecture that will be given closer to this monument on Friday will be related with more with contributions related with extremes and heavy tilt modeling. So I would like to uh, welcome Richard once more and would like everyone to join me in an applause in welcoming me to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel, for this uh, very kind and generous uh, introduction. I'm not, I'm, not used, I'm not used to that. <laughs> hey, let, me, let me begin by giving a shout out to CIM for this invitation to give the um, Pedro Nunes uh, lectures. It's really quite an uh, honor, and I'm pleased to have this opportunity uh, to do so. Uh, OK, let me. Um, let me say something about Portugal. So my, Portugal is close to, close to my heart. My first international, first overseas meeting was in 1983 at Vimero. It was a big, there was a large EVA, extreme value analysis meeting there. Actually, it wasn't called EVA back then. It, was, it predates uh, that. And it was over two weeks long. And I, I was just a, a youngster, uh, relatively speaking. And I thought this was going to be my first and last overseas conference. <laughs> and uh, you know, back then, the expectations weren't so great. We didn't really travel all that much. There weren't a lot of international conferences, many conferences within the US. And so I, I, I tried to make the most of it. And the people I met there really helped me in um, forging this path <laughs> forward that I have been on. So uh, I've had an opportunity to return to, to Portugal many times. In particular, 10 years ago, they had the 30th year, 30th year anniversary of that meeting in Vermeer in 1983. It's so different today. My young colleagues at Columbia, um, they must go to five to 10 international meetings every year. <laughs> so it's really, the, the culture has really shifted uh, a great deal. And I do feel a connection to Nunes as I, um, Probably none of you know, but growing up, I used to do a lot of yacht racing, sailboat racing, racing games, and, and ocean racing boats. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons I went to UCSD. I went to, um, much to the surprise of my mother, uh, I decided to attend the University of California, San Diego. And if you've ever been to San Diego, you would wonder why, any, why people live anywhere else. I mean, maybe Portugal is probably a good, a good uh, compa uh, comparison. And I, I did that to really pursue my sailing career. It had nothing to do with um, with academics, and so it was a, it was a tough choice whether I was going to be a professional sailor or an academic. And I still don't know if I made the right decision or not. But uh, I'm here today, anyway. So <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it goes. All right. Um, so. Uh, 
for those of you who are familiar with machine learning and data science methods, I'm afraid my title may be a little misleading. When you see samples fitting in the title, here's what you might be thinking. That you split the data somehow, you withhold a, a segment of the data, you fit a model to that segment of the data, and then you see how well that model fitting exercise performs on the data that, was, um, that you had not used yet. And that's a typical method um, that, we, that is used today. That's not what I'm going to be talking about. So it's a little bit, it's a little twist on that. And this is one of the more important and often overlooked topics in time, ser time series modeling. This is the kind of the last step in time series modeling. And you want to check to see how, um, if the model really fits. And, and so let me let me get into that. I realize that this is a it's mostly a math oriented uh, group here, general math, not so much maybe. Uh, with a statistic background. So let me give you a little primer in one slide about time series modeling. So this is all of time series modeling in one slide. <clears throat> and so, th so the idea here is that, uh, here's, here's a typical paradigm, is that you'll think about xt, these are going to be observations indexed by time, so there's a natural uh, a temporal dependence uh, in, the, in the data. And the way most models are specified in, for time series, is that you want to think about xj as some function of an ID noise sequence. So you have ID noise, these are, these are the, what are called the ZTs. Maybe they have mean zero, maybe they have variance um, sigma squared. And you want to think about xj as just a function of those guys. Maybe it would help if I had this little um, generic picture here where you have, it's a, it's a black box system where you want to think about, you have an input, which is this ID noise, and something happens in this black box, and what you see is just the observations xj. And what you'd like to do, the, the goal here, um, your mission if you decide to accept it, is to uh, uh, figure out what this function is. Okay, so that's the, uh, you want to think about this mission impossible, but it's kind of, and so the idea here is, you know, can you figure out this, this is a filter, and is it, it's a, this, what you observe at time, time j is some sort of function of the past of the, z, of the input noise. The other part of the, of the model exercise is that in, most of these models tend to be invertible. And what that means is that you can recover the zj's from the infinite past of the x's. So you can go, one, you can go both directions. So you get these xj's are a function of the zj's. And you, you can go in the other direction. I hope this notation isn't too confusing. It's minus infinity to j. It just corresponds to the data from j, j minus one, j minus two, going to the infinite, infinite past. Okay, so so here's where the um, here's where the skill comes in. Where it, it's often often an art form as well. Based on data, you have in observations from some, some time series, this could be temperature, um, some other climate uh, type data. And what you'd like to do is based on the data that you've observed, these n observations in a row, maybe n is a thousand, you have a thousand consecutive observations from this time series. And what you'd like to do is try to estimate this um, filter. And I'll call G this filter. Often these filters are some sort of function, known function of the data, and they depend on unknown parameters. This is why I have the beta there. So this may just entail estimating a beta, or it may be more general than that. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to frame this in a fairly general uh, setting here. Okay, so, so you do the estimation, and then at the end, you'd like, to, you'd like to compute the residuals. And you can compute the residuals if this model is invertible. So if you have the zj's as a function of the past of the x's, you would just replace this beta zero with however you estimated beta um, at, the, at the model fitting stage. And so what you do is you compute these z's, these are the, the residuals. And once you compute them, what do you do with them? And you would examine them, okay? And you want to check to see if they're compatible with the assumptions you made about the underlying model. So this is where the rubber meets the rubber. This is really the kind of a final check to say, you know, if this works, um, then, the, then we should see it in these estimated residuals. Or these residuals, they should, they should reinforce the assumptions that we had about um, the underlying model. You would do this in any kind of statistics uh, problem. It's a little bit more, it's a little different in uh, 
for time series. In particular, you'd like to know, are these uh, residuals here, are they uncorrelated? Are they independent? Okay, so that's, that's the starting point. So you know, you know as much as I do about time series at this, at this point. <laughs> it's a, the rest is just a matter of filling in the blanks. <clears throat> So here's the story. Let me let me show you what's what the problem is, and I want to illustrate this with what's called an autoregressive model of order ten. Why I chose ten? It's because it's big, but it's not too big, and I can illustrate the point using this AR ten. So what it means to be an AR ten is you think about xt, the, the value you, you observe today. It's a linear function of the ten previous days. So what we observe today is some sort of linear function of the previous 10 days. It's just like a regression problem, a linear regression problem, and then, you, and then you add noise. The regressors in this case are previous observations, but that's the only difference from kind of a standard re regression. So we can write this in sort of a compact way, where I think about these coefficients, the phi1 to phi10, these are called parameters, but stack them into a vector we'll call uh, both face phi, which is called phi. <clears throat> and if you take phi transpose times this both face x, which represents the 10 previous observations all stacked together, then you can see that you can write this in this nice form. So this equation reduces to that, which is the way you write kind of a standard sort of regression form. And based on, on data, x1 through xn, we want to estimate this parameter phi. And when I write it like this, it just looks like a standard regression problem. So you use least squares to do the estimation. So we, we, we do least squares. Um, <clears throat> And this is, turns out to be the estimate. You get this, um, this is you give an explicit uh, representation for phi. What, what it involves is um, gamma 10 half. This is just a covariance matrix of, these, of, the, of the regressors. I don't want to say too much about that, but if you're familiar with regression, that would be the design matrix X, 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 X prime X uh, inverse is what this guy represents here. And then this term here corresponds to like the covariance between yt and, and the regressors. Uh, usually you use yt as the response variable and regression. So this is pretty straightforward. You just uh, minimize the sum of squares, and that's the explicit uh, form for this uh, phi. And there's a, there's a theorem here that says, what, how does this phi behave? How well can you estimate the true value of phi zero? And what this theorem says is that you take the square root of n, that's the set, n is the sample size, you take phi hat minus uh, phi naught, that this converges to something that's normal, mean zero, and it has a covariance matrix by, uh, given by sigma squared times gamma 10 to the minus one. This is just sort of classic re linear regression applied in the time series context. So the way you, you want to compute residuals for this model, we, we estimate the parameter, and then we, then we look at the residuals. And so the way you look at the residuals is you take xd, the observation time t, and you take up, you subtract off its predicted value. Here I'm just going to put in a generic phi. And to think about these ETs, these residuals, as a function of, of the parameter phi that you, you're going to uh, ultimately estimate. And if you put in the true phi here, this difference here, this corresponds to exactly zt. So when you put in phi equals phi zero, you get exactly zt. But we don't have exactly phi, we have an estimate. <clears throat> this seems like a fine point, but it's an important one in statistics. This is where things can, can go wrong. So the residuals look like this. You take xt and then you subtract off your estimate of this phi, and then you look at xt minus one. So this is what you get. And then when you use xt to be equal to this guy up here, you just formally put that in. You're going to get a zt coming in, which is that guy there. And then you're going to get minus phi hat, that's what you use to estimate phi, minus phi zero transpose times is xt minus one. So right away, you see that these C zt hats are a proxy for zt. They're not exactly the zts. You can't get them uh, precisely. But they're pretty close to zts. It just offset slightly by this guy here. And this offset turns out to matter. So it seems at first glance that there's, um, that this should be okay. So the first comment here is that 
these ET hats, they're, even if the model is correct, they're, they're never independent. They're never uncorrelated. And the reason is, is they, they all depend on this T hat minus V0. They're common to all the residuals. So there's no way that these things can be uncorrelated or independent. They can be nearly so. The other aspect here is that because of that theorem I had at the bottom of the previous slide, this guy is essentially big O P to the 1 over um, square root of n. So that's what I've written there, big O P. This is in probability. And then times this x t minus 1. So this term definitely is going to 0, but it's being multiplied by x t minus 1. And it's not going to 0 fast enough, as I'm going to show. So the goodness of fit test here, um, one, this is the one that's used all the time. I, I would say it's used every, every 10 seconds of every day, <laughs> as you look at this, you look at this guy. <laughs> you look at the correlation function of these residuals and at, at lag h. And so the idea here by looking at correlations is that you look at today, you get the residuals for today, and then you look at the residuals for h days from now, and you just look at the correlation between these two. And they should be near zero. And in statistics, you want to know how close to zero should they be. And so what we normally do is we plot this as a function of h, lags one, two, three, and, and so on. And then we compare this with bounds that are given by 1.96 over the square root of that. And whenever they're outside these bands, you say it's a violation because they shouldn't, they shouldn't be outside those bands. So that's the checking the goodness of fit. When they're outside the bands, it says you probably didn't do a good job in modeling the original data. The model is always incorrect. <clears throat> Why do we compare it with 1.96 over the square root of n? So I'm designing this talk a little bit, teensy bit, for math people. Um, why? Because if you replace these estimated residuals with the true noise, with these ZTs, you get ZT, ZT plus H divided by ZT squared. So it's identical to this, only so you remove the hats. <clears throat> and it turns out that these things are, they're asymptotically normal, but they're also independent for different lengths. But they're normal with mean zero variance one over N. So if you want to construct a confidence interval <coughs> for the, the true row of H, you would take this plus or minus 1.96 over the square root of n. So that's why you use these, these are kind of sacred, these bands. So I took one realization of this AR10 model, and I computed the residuals, just like everybody else, and then I, I constructed this plot. So these little spike guys here, these are the sample correlations of the residuals. And you can see they meander around. These lines here are the plus or minus 1.96 over the square root of n. Every time series package, every sort of analysis, this is what they produce. They produce a plot that looks like this. And something looks weird about this, and that it's really small there. And they're, they're pretty reasonable over here. This one actually is a little large, but these are 30 lags. So up to about lag 10, and that's the order of the model, they're all, they're all small, much smaller than what you would expect. It's like the residuals are, the correlation of the residuals is smaller than what it is for the true uh, noise, which is a little, a little puzzling. And if I repeated this experiment a bunch of times, a thousand replications, and I just realized I didn't um, acknowledge my co-author on this, which is Leon Fernandez. When I say we did this or I did this, it's actually Leon did these calculations. <laughs> Leon's a graduate student, she's student of mine. So I don't want this to go back to Leon. I never mentioned his name, blah, blah, blah. So it's a shout out to Leon. <clears throat> And what this plot shows, um, these are these are box plots. So this is a, a lag 11, I think, if I did, if I transected there, right? And what this is, is, this corresponds to the sampling distribution of the sample correlation lag H. 
And if you believe in this asymptotic theory, which I, which I do, then that should be a possibly normal mean zero variance of one over n. And I'm not showing you the shape of the distribution, but box plot does it on the next level of summary. And so these are kind of the extremes there. But this box plot looks pretty good. It, it looks normal. In fact, they look the same for all these legs, because they should be. That's what the theory, that's what the theory says. But these guys look small. They're much smaller than what you would expect. And so if if the model is actually incorrect, then you, you might make a wrong diagnosis because you say, oh god, these are small, so it must be a really good fit. When in fact these are larger than what they should be. You don't know. You actually do know. Okay, so that that's the problem. So if I'm going to summarize this talk, here's the executive summary. These guys are too small. How do we fix that? Okay. And this is the result. This by Box and Pierce in, in 1970. And they give this limit distribution of this guy phi hat of H, uh, that's a real hat, this sample correlation of leg H. And they depend on the AR coefficients. So they know how to kind of change these bands, at least for these guys. And they would look like this. Well, if you can follow the, the laser here, it looks like this. It's some, it's some trick. But that's a hassle to kind of adjust these confidence bands. And nobody does that. That's the other thing. So what I'm telling you today is something we should, we should change the way we do this sort of analysis. So if I was writing another book or revising one, I would change it to them to, to, to We're going to do some sample splitting. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate this parameter phi. I'm not going to use all the data. I'm going to use the first half. So I'm going to estimate this phi using the first half of the data. And we're going to call that estimate phi hat of fn. So the dependence on the number of observations I'm using is going to be denoted by this fn. And then we're going to calculate not the second half of the residuals, I'm going to calculate all the residuals. Instead of using this phi hat that I used before, we use phi hat fn based on the first half of the data. So, okay, just repeat, use the first half of the data, estimate the parameters, calculate the residuals for all the data. This is a little different than what people do with sample splitting. They usually use one half to do the estimation, and then they use the other half of the remaining bit uh, to calculate residuals or whatever else they want to do. And here's that one realization. If you compare it with the same realization I used in the previous slide, is that now these guys are not small. They're not really close to zero. They were almost um, negligible before you couldn't even graph them. And now all of these guys look pretty much the same as what these guys look. And if you do a quick simulation experiment, <clears throat> these box plots look the same throughout. They're all the same. So that says that when you estimate this phi using the first half of the data, things work. You get better looking partial autocorrelation uh, function that doesn't depress these guys at the first 10 lags, so it gives you a more honest look at what's going on in assessing the goodness of fit of the data, and the simulations kind of support that. I don't know why this works. I, actually, I know why. I know the math. But it seems to violate all our principles in, in statistics. Yeah. If you want to estimate phi, use the best one you can, and that's based on all the data. You want this the ZT hat to be as close to ZT as possible, use all the data. This says don't do that. And I'm not really sure why you shouldn't, but it's a bit of magic in terms of the math. So I don't think anyone's has ever really thought of this idea before, and it just came across it by accident. <clears throat> So my motivation for thinking about sample splitting, I, I wasn't looking at this problem. I was looking at something completely different. And um, I was motivated by a paper that these folks wrote, Feister, Buhlman, Skull, called uh, and Peters in 2018. And they used sample splitting 
for estimating residuals using permutation procedures. And I kind of wanted to do the same thing. And they were looking at a regression model. There was no serial dependence in the data. So I said, Leon, we should be able to do this. And I think you'll get similar results. And this, this will be great. <clears throat> so, so Leon, go at it. And so he did some simulation, and it, didn't, <coughs> it just did not work. And the, the reason is, is because this, this the lack of independence just destroyed the way they were doing things. So that was disappointing. But there was something that came out of it in, in, in terms of the, of the math and why this works for this particular uh, setting. So let me do just a slightly deeper dive of the AR1 model to show you what's going on and show you a little bit of the math behind it. We're going to split the data. We have n observations into possibly non-overlapping sets. And we discovered this be, because we were looking at non, um, initially we were looking at non-overlapping sets. Most people do this, don't use, you know, they'll take maybe 30% of the data to estimate the model, they'll take the 70% to kind of confirm the model fit. And that's not what we did. We took the first FN observations and we'll estimate this fee, we'll get a fee out from that. And then we'll look at the last LN observations. And it turns out, most of the time, the last LN, you'll take LN to be N, meaning you'll use all the observations. But you could look at the last LN set of observations to compute these residuals. So you get ZT hat, uh, which is ZT minus, and then this, this offset, which is this term. And when you look at the correlation, you also, it's a covariance divided by variance. So here's an estimate of the variance based on the last LN observations, you get the ZT hat uh, based on the last LN residuals, you get just the sum of squares of the, yeah, these guys. I'm not doing any mean correction here. It's, it's not a factor, really. And so this, this is what you get. And this converges in probability to the, to the, the variance of the noise, which is good. So this, the sample splitting or non-sample splitting has nothing to do with estimating the variance. It's the covariance that drives us. <clears throat> So sample covariance, what you do is you take a ZT, you take today's value, and then you, you lag it by H times this, H times it's going forward, and then you look at the cross product of these two, and you take the sum. You take the average sum. So that's what this guy is. I'm, I realize I'm missing, it should be one over LN here up front. I thought these slides were perfect this morning. <laughs> gotcha. This is a first. So you should have one over. Right here. Mm -hmm. And then the, co the correlation at lag H is just this covariance divided by the variance. So it, it's just this um, sums of cross products divided by the sums of squares. And the theorem that we show here is that the correlation, this guy here, it's based on essentially LN residuals. So you take the square root of LN and then you look at the sample correlation at lag H. This is asymptotically normal, with mean zero, and now there's a variance, gamma squared gamma. In the case when you use, when you, and the, the z's or hats are replaced by the true values, the zt's, then this thing is equal to one. And what's coming into play when you do the co-covariance of these guys is you get a zt times zt plus h, which is great. But then you get another term, phi hat minus phi xt minus one, times the same thing, phi hat minus phi, x t plus h minus one. And those x t's have dependence on it. And that kind of wrecks things. You don't get that if the x's are independent. And so we have an explicit form for this gamma squared, uh, sigma squared gamma. And it looks like this. It's one plus the thing in green, which is k r a minus two k o v. I'll explain what that is. Here's a phi to the 2h minus 1, 1 minus phi squared. These are things we're trying to estimate. So you, you have to do a plug-in to estimate that variance. The KRA turns out it's a limiting ratio. So we'll think about LN, the last number of observations we, we use is proportional to N, it could be N. And FN is again proportional to N. So it's a ratio of these proportions, the limit ratio. <clears throat> KOV is the overlap. So that's 
the number of observations that are overlap between the first FN and the last LM. So there's some overlap. That's this guy over here. If there's overlap. And it's a relative overlap relative to <coughs> FN. And so often, if there's no overlap between FN, the first FN and the last um, LN, this thing is going to be equal to zero. If you use LN equal to N, and FN is uh, whatever it's equal to, then LN minus N is going to be zero. This is equal to one. So the overlap is one, um, and then you get, you get just <laughs> LN minus two times the overlap. So, if you take this car K R A um, equal to two times K O V, if you make this thing equal to zero, then you just get one, and that's the classic result, and that's what we did. So when L N is equal to N, you get that this guy is equal to one. You get one. Um, I get this right. You get um, when when L N is equal to N and F N is half, you get that this is equal to two. You get n divided by n over 2, which is equal to 2. You get 2 minus 2, and the overlap is 1. 2 minus 2, I, I told you it would be higher math than this. 2 minus 2 is equal to 0. <laughs> and so this term, this, this term disappears, and you just get round. And that's the result we were looking for. So it, 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 I think it's magic. I don't, you know, it's interesting that it turns out that way. <coughs> In the classical case, Ln and Fn are the same, so this ratio is equal to 1. This minus 2 overlap, um, this thing is, it turns out to be uh, Ln is equal to N, and this turns out to be 1. So you get 1 minus 2. 1 minus 2 is minus 1, and so that's the correction factor you have to make. The asymptotic variance is much smaller than what uh, it, it should be. Okay, so let's, are we are we okay? I know it's heavy heavy on the statistics side. All right, so just to show you um, that the theory works is that we have a bunch of observations here. And, um, I think it's a thousand observations from an AR10 model again. <coughs> And the red lines are the, the red dash lines are the plus or minus two where we square them in each of these plots. So these are successive plots of autocorrelation function. And the, the black lines here corresponding to confidence intervals for the sample correlation of the estimated residuals. And so these are essentially 0.975 quanti upper quantile of normal, and not normal, of that sampling distribution. And this is 0.025. Um, the quantile, the sampling distribution of the sample correlation. And you can see that these lines, the black and the red dash, they don't overlap. And here we're only using 100 observations to do the estimation. So these guys are, are kind of wildly off. They should, these, these curves should overlap, the black and the red. When you use 200 observations to do the estimation, it comes down a little bit. When you use 300, it comes down. <coughs> 400 is getting close, and when you use 500, they overlap perfectly. That's the theory. When you use too many observations to estimate, then these black curves go below the red dash, meaning the confidence intervals should be much smaller than what, you're, well, what you say they are. And as you keep doing this, you see a pattern, very clear. And finally, when you get to Fn equals to 1,000 observations, this is the classical result. Those are those little um, box, tiny box plots that we saw around zero for the small legs up to like 10 or so. And this, this is kind of consistent. This is what our theory is, 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 is telling us. So the upshot here is that here's a, here's a new way to do these plots. And we should all be. Um, adapting, adopting uh, this, I think this procedure, um, at least for these sorts of models. So, you're probably thinking, God, this is very specific to this AR thing. What about other models? Okay, 
like no one's thinking that, but I'm thinking that. <laughs> So the same results, it turns out they hold more generally. So if you start with this model that I started with on almost page one of the, of the, of the slides, you'll see that um, there's xj is the function of the, previous, of the past of the z's, and you can recover the z's from the h. From the h. <clears throat> And the result is essentially the same. That is, if you use half the data to estimate the parameters, so this could be nonlinear violence, it doesn't have to be linear, it could be a class of armor processes, which are everywhere in the series. If you use all the residuals, then you're good. And uh, this is what I think people should be doing. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's go up in, in sophistication. This was the original problem that I was, I was interested in, it was um, not correlation, but measuring dependence. And so I think people know that you can have dependent data that's some correlated. So something's called distance covariance. You take two random vectors, x and y, and the way this works is you take the joint characteristic function of x and y, Evaluate at S and T, and then you take the product of the marginal characteristic functions for X and for Y. They're functions of S and T. S and T are both um, p dimensional uh, variables here. And you integrate this out with some weight function, mu ds dt. And the common choice uh, for mu is uh, given by, in this paper by Selke et al. And it's, you just take ds, uh, you take a product measure here, you take S. The, the modulus of S rate is to the P plus one power, and same for T, there's some constants involved. Um, and in this case here, this is not something you really want to do the integral of, but there's a closed form expression for it, T of X, Y. It's in terms of products of first moments you know, between X and, and Y. So think about X and Y as a random vector, and you take X prime, Y prime, and X double prime, Y double prime, independent copies of that, this can be written explicitly in terms of the moments, the product moments of these guys. And so it's a very nice formula. Um, statisticians start drooling when they see stuff like that because you can estimate this very easily. There's other weight functions one uh, can use and some nice choices, but this thing uh, has some desirable properties. So here's this distance you know, covariance function, and you estimate that by replacing the characteristic function with the empirical characteristic function. So you have data x1 up to xn, y1 up to yn, and the joint characteristic function is just you, you, you do the empirical distribution relative to the empirical, di uh, empirical characteristic function, which is this guy relative to the empirical distribution. And the, the idea here is that for a stationary time series, you want to kind of test independence. So the way you'll do this is You'll take x maybe, this x here to be equal to xt, and you'll take xt plus h to be equal to this, um, take y to be xt plus h. So this is, this is like the analog of a sample of the correlation function, only it's using this distance covariance. And the thing to note, which I didn't say, is that the random vectors x and y are independent if and only if this thing's equal to zero, because the product of the characteristic functions the joint characteristic functions would be the product of the two characteristic functions. So this is much better than correlation, because correlation, unbeaten and correlated just tells you that they're correlated. It doesn't say anything about independence. This says that they're independent. So it goes much further than that. And there are a lot of time series models that, especially in, in financial econometrics, where the data is uncorrelated but, but dependent, and you want to model that dependence. And so the you know, theorem says something about this. Um, <clears throat> this estimate of this distance autocorrelation function, and what it says, you take n times this guy, it converges to this integral. And the integrand there is a, um, the GH, this is a Gaussian random field, um, and you integrate it all to that weight measure, and then you get some constant coming out. So this G on the inside is a complex uh, value in the Gaussian process. <clears throat> 
And if you do this for the residuals um, from an AR model, what you get is you don't get this. You get this plus this. There's an offset term that comes in. And I think a lot of people didn't realize this was going to be causing a problem. <clears throat> So, we have a method. Let's use the first 10 observations, the, say the first half. Observations estimate the parameters of a model. We're going to use the last LM. Say we use all the residuals to estimate. Uh, and then we're going to apply this. Um, we're going to look at the this is a sample auto, auto distance correlation function. So you get LM times this guy, and it converts this in distribution to this thing with an offset. So you get an offset. It's kind of complicated, and uh, I don't want to go into details. Just to show you it's complicated, I'll write down some equations. Uh, you don't need to do this. It's just complicated. <clears throat> and then the question was, when does this offset matter? So when is this thing equal in distribution to this thing without that offset? It seems weird that that can happen, but it does. It's because there's some negative correlation between this random field and this random field. And one is a stochastically small, and one is a stochastically bigger. You want to know that because to do quantiles, if it's stochastically bigger, your quantiles are going to be larger than what you would hope for an ID situation. And when they're bigger and smaller, the quantiles say they're smaller. And that means that you'll be making a wrong judgment when you do the inference. So that's why it's kind of important to know the direction of this. <clears throat> so that's what, that's what this is saying. So that's, so that's something that we, we explored. And let me just go, since I think time is running short here, let me just go uh, cut to the chase. So what we'd like to do is choose sample splits such that the integrand here is equal to just the thing without that offset. This means in distribution for all S and T. So as a stochastic process, so the same. It seems, it seems like this guy has to be zero. But that's not the way it works. <clears throat> So in other words, the covariance function of the left has to be the same as the covariance function on the right. The covariance function completely determines the Gaussian process. And I need mean, like this slide. So what you would like to say is the covariance function of the left is equal to the covariance function of the right. You can write this out. The covariance function on the right is just this guy. And then you get terms in, in braces by the covariance between the two terms. And what you do, you do the sample splits to get this term equal to zero, the term inside the brackets. Well, it takes some effort. <laughs> it turns out if you start with noise, which is normal zero sigma squared, then this term in the brackets is going to be zero, in which case this thing is equal to that. And the reason for that is because you get a term which is the derivative of the characteristic function divided by the characteristic function of T1. And as we all know from elementary stat, maybe it's not that elementary, is that if it's normal zero one, it's a characterization of a standard norm. The, characteristic, the derivative of the characteristic function divided by T times the characteristic function is minus one for all T. So this thing, if we use those splits, it works. That's the message, it works. It also, um, it doesn't work for most other distributions you, you can think of. Usually this guy depends on T and is not independent of T. What we can show is that for Laplace, this thing is greater than minus one, which says that the quantile, the, the quantiles, the sampling quantiles are going to be larger than what you would expect using the true norms. So, um, there's two kind of key levels, and maybe I'll, I'll just end on, on, this, on this note. One is that th there is some math in here. <laughs> <laughs> the first is that if you have two mean zero Gaussian processes, and if the covariance function is a funny symbol here is less than this, that means <clears throat> that 
if you look at the covariance matrix of x1 for any set of points S, Sj, Tj, that that covariance matrix is less than or equal to this covariance matrix, meaning the difference is non-negative difference. So this covariance matrix is bigger than that in the sense that the difference is, is positive difference. And if that's the case, then these two integrals, one is going to be smaller stochastically than the other. So this looks like it should be a trivial result, but it's not. OK, so there's some analysts maybe in the, in the group. So here's the next. <coughs> Normally, I don't do these lemmas. <laughs> But it's a nice, it's a, it's a nice map. Um, if z is a, has a t distribution with new degrees of freedom, then it's a nice, beautiful formula for the density function, the public density function, the random over t. It's got these gamma functions in there, and it's got this thing raised to some power. Then it turns out that the characteristic function, a derivative divided by the characteristic function times 2, t times sigma squared is greater than equal to minus 1 for all t. So the characteristic function of this guy here, so you take the e to the i t z, and then you integrate out z, you get something like this. So this involves a Bessel function of the second kind, which is this guy here, uh, k gamma uh, nu over t, that's a nu is a degree of freedom times this guy here, divided by this function here. And if you take the derivative divided by this, you get this ratio of Bessel functions. And what we'd like to say is something about this thing being bigger than or equal to minus one. And we can do that. And it, it relies on that kind of a trillion type inequality in modified Bessel functions, which says that if you take the product of this, this is greater than uh, this guy here. And so that's what's used here to kind of establish Establish this result. So that was kind of it was nice. It was um, it was nice to have uh, such a result. But usually these ratios are going to depend on t. It's hard to put you know bounds one way or the other. And it's less than some constant or greater than some constant for all t. They usually depend on t. Let me just show you a picture of that situation here using distance on correlation function. Here is Kn, we use 100 observations to estimate things. Here we're using Gaussian noise. In this case, it's supposed to work. And here's the, the 0.95 uh, quantile, sampling quantile for lot of distance correlation function using 100 observations. As you go to 500, they, they over, and that's what the theory tells us. If you go beyond 500 observations to do the estimation, then the black line goes below the red one. And so it would be saying things are, are independent when in fact they're dependent. So this will alter the way you do that. Uh, what about power? Who doesn't love power? Let's skip it. Okay. One criticism might be is that in statistics we want to know um, something about power, and that is the likelihood of you making a wrong decision. So maybe we'll spend that on this. So the, the model here is, a, is an AR2 model, but the true model is an AR1. So suppose we fit, we accidentally fit an AR1 when we should have fit an AR2, and then with just on a distance correlation function, all these tests should show us that you know, if you, the model is really an AR2, it says you're making a mistake and should tell us. It should, this, these test statistics should be above these dashed, red dashed lines. When G2 is equal to zero, this is actually an AR1, so things are good. So they're all, they all hover around this, this line here, which is, which is fine. The ones that hover closest actually is the one based on this new procedure we're talking about, using where you, you fit half the data. To, you fit the first half of the data, uh, model to the first half of the data, and, do, uh, and, and then use the residuals based on all the data. So the blue and the, and the red, they're pretty close to this, where the kind of standard 
blue box test, which has been used for 30, 40 years or so, it doesn't work so well. But these other G's up here correspond to one you have from, uh, and what this shows is that actually <coughs> if, if G2 is 0 0.3, 0 0.3 here is pretty close to zero, then all these tests do the job and show that 100 times uh, nothing, you'll see that these are above these constant spans and say it's not the model is okay. So that's the notion of power in, in physics. So you not only want this to be right, but you want to have power against alternatives. And so these, you're not sacrificing anything. In fact, it still seems to work just as well, if not better, than sort of the standard procedures. Okay. Here's a postscript, which I think I'll skip. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll just say it in a sentence. I gave this talk about a month or so ago. This is very, very new stuff. There's someone in the audience that said, you know, there's this paper that does the same idea, and it was presented at an Oberwolfach meeting. Who could, uh, I'm sure many of you have gone to Oberwolfach in 1976, and it's, it has to do with estimating the empirical, estimating the CDF, and then you have to estimate parameters in the model. It was a tricky problem. And it was reproduced, so I guess there was a paper in, written, well, it was presented in 1976, and then this paper was picked up and printed in some book <coughs> uh, by Spring, Empirical Distributions and Processes. Stuck the papers from a meeting at our world for a long time ago. And there's a similar idea here. And this was done by, by James German, kind of a legendary statistician, well known statistician from London School. And what I, hear, what, I, what I think is that people, people do reference this paper, but I don't think they read it. So you see this. I do, I'm, I'm at fault, it's the same thing. I see another paper, and then they reference a lot of stuff. And I'll reference that other paper, but I actually don't read it. Or I just look at it, I skim it. And there's, I think it happened in this paper because there's content in here. And there's this one subsection that is fascinating, actually. I've never seen anyone talk about it before, but I think it's been kind of ignored in the literature. So even though people cite this paper, I don't think they were. That's my, that's my, that's my theory. Okay, so in the take home message, this first half, estimate the parameter, look at through all the residuals. Mod's correct, then we should, get, we should get the right stuff. And if you want to use distance autocorrelation function, if you think the noise is normal, then this, this also works. It doesn't work all the time, but it works uh, in some cases. So this is yet to be um, this is yet to be explored. But anyway, it's, uh, it's these are kind of interesting results, kind of ch changing perhaps the way we do this final check in time series in time series models. So I mean, again, thanks for the invitation to deliver these talks, or the first one, and thank you uh, for coming and for your attention. Uh, So, time for questions, comments, remarks. We have a shy audience today. Please. Okay, thank you very much, Christian, for the Thank you very much. It was a fascinating talk. Um, and I'm going to ask you from point of view of someone who teaches the time series for a long time. I, indeed, I started teaching time series with your book, uh, but uh, nowadays uh, students will kill me. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, so should we uh, teach this to students? Did you try? Uh, because time series is rather difficult for them, as it is nowadays. Did I try using this? Yeah. Um, for some reason, they don't let me teach time series. Um, <laughs> 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 um, um, 
But if I were teaching time yes. I would definitely do this. And that would be what I've talked to. He said, um, just one guy said, I've changed their lives and thought, how are they going to do this? They're going to do, gonna do it this way. It's a very easy change. Uh, you don't need any software to do this. In R or whatever, you just tell it you want to fit the, the model to half the data, and then you compute the residuals for all of it, which you should do, and boom, you're done. You know, it's no sophisticated package. So we'll definitely do this. So, and what about that uh, cycle that we went from the time series? Because then we are going to the uh, last time series. We will have just uh, um, a small sample to fit the, 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 the model. It's a time series as well. Is the, the length is small? Is that what you're asking? Yes, yes. If the end is smallish. I haven't, I haven't tried it. Okay. <laughs> so you'd be a little bit worried. Anyway, yeah. Sample's too small, so you have to do it. That is the I'm, I'm suggesting they use all the data to identify the model. Right. So you can say, okay, it's an AR4 or an ARMA21 or whatever, do that. But I'll use all the data. Then when you want to do the confirmation, go back and estimate the model. But if the number of parameters becomes large and uh, if the sample size is not large, then it's a But that's true. Different degrees in all states. I think I, I will try next semester. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you. More questions, please? It is a very general question. Uh, in the era of machine learning, that's what we are dealing now, what is your op opinion concerning the challenges that uh, time series modeling is facing nowadays? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, Recently, one of my colleagues at Columbia, who is a pretty well-known machine learner, and is writing a book on machine learning, machine learning, he says, I'm going to include a chapter on time series, <laughs> which I put in here. He knows nothing about time series, but they do it anyway, because they have like, you know, a black box kind of method of how to do this thing. So, um, I made some comments that, you know, doing stuff like time series of counts and that stuff where you have a, a, a special type of model, which is a generalized linear, generalized state space model. You know, those methods probably work pretty well, but, and, and you can go ahead and do it. But I think all the diagnostics and all that stuff is kind of missing. And, and you see that a lot. They, they calculate information criterion and they compare models by information criterion. But information criterion doesn't tell the whole story. It just tells you how to compare various models. It doesn't tell you if any of those models are usable fit. And the, way, the reason why you look at residuals is they often indicate a modification you should make to, to, the, to the model. So there's, there's a lack of emphasis on that uh, sort of aspect because there's a very strong back but they do well, but I don't think they always they can be kind of standard good time series. Um, so um, there's definitely a place uh, for this. I mean, they're going to get better and better. But I think I think it's good to know the basic time series model before you jump off the off the machine learning cliff. I don't want to cause any waves. So, I also have questions. Uh, so, there's also these permutation ideas that you've developed and used also in terms of the extremogram, in terms of destroying the panels by the permutations. How do they compare in terms of performance with this approach? This method is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty, 
permutation methods on estimated residuals is a problem. And if you go back to this paper by Buchmann and uh, Attell, that's what they try to overcome by the sample splitting, and they're able to do that. But when you have time series dependence, it doesn't work. I have another way of thinking about doing the permutation, and that is, um, you may not like this, but we do the permutation on not the full data, but on half, half the data, estimate the parameters and half the data. It's just the first half, the first two thirds, or something like that. And then we do the permutations on that. What I think's happening with the permutations, if you do permutation on all the data, there's too much dependence in that. But if you just do it on the first, say, k observations, first k residuals or k is fixed, and n goes to infinity, it's asymptotically correct. It's just when you take k equals n, things go, may go haywire. So I'm OK with permutations, but with that caveat. OK. And there's, there's also the, the question in terms of the, where there can be different blocks of, of size n divided by 2. And can there be a pause on that for under misclassification of this? OK, so, so the question is, the, do I need to do n over 2 consecutive observations, maybe? Or, uh, or are there situations under which you can consider different subgroups of size and divided by two. For example, I was thinking in terms of model misspecification, whether it might be convenient. Yeah, I think you need n, n over two consecutive observations. Now, they could do the second half. Yeah. They don't have or to Or other parts. I'm not sure about that. I don't think that works, actually. OK. But because there's a strong dependence here between the, the, um, the correlations of the the X's in those residuals, and they have to, it has to come up. Yeah. 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 And you start messing with that, and you know, so I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to commit on that. Okay. Second half is fine. I mean, there's symmetry right here. You have a, you, you have a time series of length n. If you do the first half, or in the second half, it doesn't really matter. The second half could be thought of as the first half if you went backwards and down. Yeah. So, is there anything even to gain if you do it twice, with the first half and then the second half? Or, or no gain? Um, <laughs> well, you, you'd get two different statistics in. You take the best one, is that what you're saying? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't see that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for an extra question. Uh, I remember that in the beginning with uh, the first part of your presentation, uh, you, uh, you uh, chose or you simulated data with an AR10. And uh, have you tried a smaller order, like an AR1 or 2? Because maybe then the correlation for higher lags were not so strong. And maybe the standard theory would apply better. I don't know. This is just a The other one has exactly the same issue at lag one. And it, and it could be more than, than the first lag. It's just that the the variance, I had this, I'm going to go back to it. Close to the unit work situation. 
Yeah. Pi is large. It's yeah, it's definitely close to the to the inner root. root. And what, what that means is that this thing becomes really, um, really tiny uh, because it, you're essentially subtracting it. For higher lags, this thing goes to zero, kind of geometrically. So it doesn't you can't you can't see it really so much for an, an AR1. So to to demonstrate this, I wanted to show more lags because if you just saw one lag being really small, you'd say, oh, okay, who cares about all that? And for an AR10, it's, 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 it's much more obvious. But the same, exactly the same thing uh, happens. And what's interesting is if, um, you know, from, from the tangent here, is that there's a definite problem that if you know I model if P is equal to zero, which it looks like this thing should be, should be zero. But when phi is equal to zero, this, all of this actually goes up. This is not, this is not quite, this is not the right result. So there's, there's some degeneracy in here. I just thought it was easy. If you saw the plots were only at one lag that it was small, uh, you wouldn't be convinced. You'd say, why is this guy wasting all this time on this thing? I mean, it's just for a visual display. So in the interest of time, so I suggest we end here. So I'll, I'll hand over to when you will make a final housekeeping announcement, but I'd like to thank uh, Richard ladies once more and that's awesome. Thank you. So just before closing, uh, I thank the speaker and the chairman and the audience uh, again. And uh, if you find something outside interesting, too, please help yourself. There will be some snacks and refreshments, I hope. So please help yourself and, and thank you very much.